Hi, my name is Elijah, and welcome to my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. My guest today is Kyle Falconer. Kyle is best known for being the frontman and songwriter in Murky Award nominated Scottish indie rock band The View. He's recently released two brilliant solo albums and is back with The View with new music and currently on tour. We speak about his early influences growing up, what it's like being in a band, how songs arrive for him, the muse, his influences, and much, much more. So please enjoy this podcast, subscribe, and thank you for listening. Today, my Songwriting for Songwriters podcast, my special guest is Kyle Falconer. How are you doing, Kyle? Not bad, man. Not bad. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing okay, mate. I'm doing okay. So it was good to hear some um, new music from The View. I'm absolutely loving the new tunes you put out on uh, on Spotify. I found them the other day. They're, they're absolutely amazing. Nice one. Thank you, man. How, how's that um, feeling to be back in the band after some time off and some solo projects? Is it uh, good to be back with the boys? Yeah, um, we, rec- we recorded um, Cod with Youth. Was it this year or last year? Okay. It was last Last March we recorded it, and we planned on getting it out pretty soon. But these things never happen that way. It's always a, uh, always takes a bit of time in the process and labels and all that stuff. But yeah, yeah it was good, man. Um, what a what a new what a what what a new drummer, what a guy called Eddie that was playing for us, who's been like a long time um, a long time, a friend of youth. He's known him since he was a kid, so it was good to. To work with somebody new and just have a different vibe, and also we've um always wanted to go to youth studio in Spain, but every time we've, we've worked with them a couple of times, and they've never, they, I think it's never worked out. They were able to go to the Spain, the Spanish house, so but we ended up space doing it. Space Mountain, like, right? Space Mountain, yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It looks amazing. Yeah, it's a, ma- ma- it's a magical place. And um, I think before that, we've done we, we went to Brit Row before, and then we've done somewhere in Bethnal Green, but that was cool, man. It was great. It was just a good vibe. Oh, yeah, it sounds class. really, it sounds really fresh, man. It's like it's, I mean, it's hooky as hell, but and just like you know, it's kind of shoveling his hands, is just like such an earworm. But it's such a great sort of cinematic sound as well. It's really sort of something slightly different from you guys, but like really, really like maintaining all that quality with just a really bigger sound in some ways, man. It's really good. Yeah, I mean, um, when we first recorded with Youth, um, two thousand eleven, we still had that. Um, kind of young, young sort of hoodlum approach. <laughs> and like, mm. we're still like dead Scottish. I mean, it's funny because working with different artists like Matt Ronson and like d- doing my solo projects and be- doing a bit more stuff that's a bit more poppy. Yeah. Um, being back then, it was, it was like, I really had to be like, total, I wanted to stick to my Scottish roots. And I remember youth even going like back then on t- in 2011 or that was always, it's always been quite important for people. Um, it's funny because even my daughter, like, uh, she's six and she goes, I've had the same jeans on for four days now. And I'm like, I don't know, like that, do And she's like, oh, you do, Dad. <laughs> it's funny. But uh, I never really realised it. And then, but even, like, a, a, my family members and that, like, you don't sound as Scottish as you used to. Um, and I think that become, comes from, I mean, even my, uh, like, when you stop, when I had kids, um and I stopped touring with the band. I mean, it's been nearly six years, and then my, my missus is from Edinburgh, so she's a bit more polite <laughs> than me coming that, that, that rather than touring around, with, touring, touring around with a bunch of Scottish hoodlums and like <laughs> running riot. So like, you, I kind of lost the slang a bit. I mean, I go I go straight back into it when when I'm with them. But it's funny because whenever I'm with them, she's like, "Oh my god, you just go back into like yeah. just schemey boy mode." <laughs> 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 but yeah, but it's it's funny because. We were always trying to be true to ourselves in the songs, but then I look back and I go, "What? Why, why am I singing so Scottish? It doesn't even sound like me." But just, I just suppose it's just with age growing up and and now, um, it's kind of like a gimmick, I suppose. Uh, I think people connect to that though, mate. It's this, um, you know, it's 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 real, isn't it? It's honest. It's this sort of thing, same thing with the Beatles, or you know, it's like there's just honesty there, and that's I think that's part of what your initial kind of appeal was as a band, really, just that kind of the lads, you know, down the road doing the music, it was something which was appealing and fresh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think just working with different artists, um, I, I've started, I do a lot of writing in LA. Um, well, I, I did, like, in the past past few years, and everyone, like, even then, you got to tone it down, like, just to, to talk to people. And 
Sure. Even to get a drink at a bar, you've got to you've got to really tone the accent down. They're just like, "What the hell are you saying, man?" <laughs> I mean, it's different if you're from Glasgow or Edinburgh, but Dundee's a kind of different, yeah. a different kettle of fish altogether. So I think um, when I was writing with a lot of people there, and you're doing demos, or there was I was in with a lot of rap artists and stuff, so they were just like, oh, "Dude, what the fuck are you saying, dog?" <laughs> I'm like, Yo, so now it's like I'm just like basically just put an American accent everywhere I was going because it's not like you're in front of anyone. He's yeah. going to go with why are you why are you always speaking American? You could just yeah. do it and get away with it, you know what I mean? So it was fine, yeah. and then singing American accent, so it was fine. Um, awesome, man. And but, so how's the um, what's the in the view? Are you are you the main songwriter, or is it more of a collaborative kind of vibe with with you guys? It's it's all it started off as a collaborative, um, like um, like I would I, I kind of like. We'd me and Ke- me or Kieran would write the songs and bring them to the band. Yeah. And then there was times where there's times where we kind of on albums. I mean, the first album was more like, like I'd write a chorus for Kieran or whatever, and he'd he come in with a couple of lines, and it was like we felt we felt this closeness. But I think after after I moved to London, and then Kieran, everyone kind of moved away from different places and started mm-hmm. getting their own lives, and then yeah. it kind of became less. Less collaborative, but we've always had we've always had that. Yeah, I mean, on the last the last album there, um, like uh, there's a couple of Kieran songs are a bit more political than mine's. Mine's are a bit more um w- wacky and like I mean, I, my influences are like Crowded House and Squeeze and like uh, like Making Mechanics and okay. like I mean, the Beatles, Oasis are all my big ones, but I mean, I, but I'm I'm a bit more I like stuff that's a bit more dreamy and. Mm. Uh, Kieran's stuff's a bit more political, so I think that's where we kind of, yeah. where I, I kind of, if he's doing a, a song that is political, and I don't, because I, I, I'm not really into any of that stuff, so I'll, I'll just be like, oh, well, why don't we put a spin on it, and we'll, I'll do the middle eight, and I'll do the chorus. Yeah. That's kind of how it will work. Great. Um, but I mean, it's always, it's always been different. I mean, Pete, the guy from the other guy from the view, he started writing a bit as well, so that's been pretty cool as well. Um, but yeah, um, I think um. At the start, I mean, when we first started out with the view, we were like we were like total brothers, and we won the talent show together, and like we tour, we never, we were always we stayed everywhere with each other. We used to like share like each other's like brew money and like yeah. buy like super noodles and just like never leave, we're rehearsing all the time. And then as stuff got, I mean, it happens to every band, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's totally, man. But once we started, yeah, but once, I mean, we've, yeah, we've always been collaborative. It's always been a quite a close knit thing. But I think after um. Touring for all them years, and we called it a break. It was like it was a bit coming back. It was a bit like we need to make sure that everyone's happy, and it's quite hard to it's quite hard to balance that. It's really hard, um, yeah. Because obviously, oh, oh, yeah. Because I mean, I've I've been away to I've been away doing all my own thing, and me I produced and wrote and recorded all the instruments on my first solo album, and that was great. But then I kind of missed having the view. Yeah. I missed having that input and just it being me. But then it did feel good and quite liberating to do it all myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just do absolutely everything. That was great. But then, on the next, the the next album I done, I was like, I'd like, I'd like a, 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 a there was this guy called Frankie Saragusa who I met in Los Angeles, and I was like, would you be up for doing an album? It was COVID, so we, we kept trying to find some way to get over to America for me to do it. And I co-wrote with loads of different people. I co-wrote with Alex Greenwald from Phantom Planet. A guy called Justin Stanley who like who produces all the Beck stuff, and he's like the drummer for Beck. Brilliant. Um, who else? Uh, this guy called Jesse Singer, who who was he's, he was a like, amazing um multi instrumentalist. Um, a guy called Mikey Reeves, who's like a big country writer in America. Um, so we've done like a, I was inviting that, you know what I mean? Because I was kind of fed up writing on my own, and yeah. I just wanted a bit of a change, and I wanted to go right down the pop route. So that's why I got Frankie because when I done that record, that No Thank You album, which was my first solo album, it's good, yeah. but. It was uh, it kind of got categorised as oh, another indie album, and I was like, well, that's kind of what I do. Then I thought, right, I'm going to venture off a wee bit, yeah. And uh, so I started. That's when I started collaborating with other people, um, which is a weird one as well because <clears> there was a lot of guys in America where where you where you write with people, and I've never done this. It's always been, I mean, if I do anything with Kieran, we always we always just do a key, uh, fault in the Webster anyway. So that's just the rule we made when we were kids, but um. It was a weird one because obviously when I done the No Thank You album, my first one, that was that I got like I got all the credit for that. And it felt good, but that wasn't like oh, that didn't feel like a 
like I'd accomplished something. It wasn't like, oh, yes, I've finally done everything myself. I felt like, oh, I wish I'd kind of collaborated with somebody there, mm. which it was good to experience that. But then when I was collaborating with some people in America, they, like, it's a weird thing because I'd never done it. There was a lot of people like, when you come in this room, it's 50-50. And I was like, okay, okay, whatever. And then I'd write the full song. And then it would be like, <laughs> then I'd come away and I'd be like, well, these guys are still getting 50% of these royalties. And I've had managers in the past that have been like, no, I'll go and fight that for you. But it's then at the end of the day, you, the older you get, you're like, is it worth it? You've already made the deal. Yeah. It's like, I, I could have went in there and if I had been such a... Sorry, what you saying? No, no, I heard a really good story about that, actually. Chris Difford does lots of songwriting courses and camps. And he was telling me a story that he was um, working with, I think, Belinda Carlisle. No, not him. Actually, he had a camp and he set up Belinda Carlisle and two other writers. And one of those writers fell to sleep in the session. So at the end of it, she was like, well we're not going to split the royalty share with with him and chris made the point of going well you are because if you hadn't fallen to sleep you wouldn't ri- you wouldn't have written the song that you wrote you know him falling to sleep was part of the kind of process of that song coming in so it's like yeah, you said exactly, yeah. it, it? you know yeah i mean um yeah I mean, I've, I've been at like i've been doing a a songwriting camp that's why i'm so tired today i've, I've actually just got back from a i was doing a we've done a, we a week songwriting camp and then I had to come back for to do two festivals with the view. Then I spent a day with the kids and I went straight back into doing another songwriting camp with Blaine Harrison from Mystery Jets. Mm. And then we went straight into a music festival in Spain that we had. So I've been there for like nearly three weeks. It's been really intense and obviously I've been missing yeah. the kids. But we got we got reined in for like ten days and it was like and everyone was so intense and everyone's waking up and like some some people are great songwriters, some people have never written a song in their life. I mean we don't we don't um we don't vet anybody that comes. Anyone's allowed to come to camps. There's been a few mm-hmm. ones that I've been, I used to spend a lot of time in Thailand as well, where they were like, oh, you've got to hand in a CV, basically, if you want to come to this camp. And uh, mm-hmm. our one, we were just like, we said, anybody can come, so it's pretty risky sometimes. You get some some nutters coming, you know what I mean? Like, that, that, like is don't it, you, are you so setting been... up this camp? Is this your, is this your kind of, um your thing? Yeah, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, me, me and my best mate, Michael Ward, we, we bought the place last year specifically to do this, but we've been, Amazing. While we've been kind of setting, setting up, we've just we, we bought it in June last year and put the first camp on in August, so it was pretty yeah. fast. Um, but it's it's getting bigger and bigger, and there's like there's all selling out. And I, the, the plan was to to do it so that I didn't need to keep going over, obviously, because I've got kids. Yeah. So this worked out that way. We've now got we had Blaine Harrison just do one. The next the next one we've got John McClure from uh, brilliant from Reverend, Reverend Makers, then we've got Callum Beatty, who's like a, a big I think it's a, it's a Scottish singer-songwriter, then we've got Mogwai, the guy from Mog Stewart from Mogwai yeah. doing one. Amazing. We've got, uh, we've got a guy called Cool, cool Kid, who does all the, he does all the, all the K-pop songs, all the BTS stuff and BST, whatever they're called, so it's good. I think this year's been really tough, I, um, not this, well, the whole, since last June, because it's been like basically one to two weeks at a time and I've been having to go go over there and like but I've been I've been kind of having to sell them on but it's just like kind of fans of the, the view and stuff so it's been it's been worth it as an experience but it does take its toll on you like yeah. just having to write songs so basically um because we I've heard the song down camps and I've been there when they're on the go and I've seen them but I've never been involved with ones so we just kind of made up our own rules and it's that's worked out great we've, the way we do it is brilliant we've, we've basically got all the songs and we put them onto a hard drive and then we've got Every camp that comes, we've got this big collection, all these songs that we're going to, once we get them all mixed and that, we're going to put it on Spotify. There's going to be like an LSC, which is Last Year at Casa. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a Spotify playlist. And then where the View's first manager is now, we're about to start a label and he's he's managing the label, but he, they're over there right now building the recording studio. So yeah. that's been taking some time. And basically, basically all the cash that we make from there goes into the, the, the studio. So obviously me and my best mate are not getting paid to be there. So it's like... It's just like taking all this time out for the last year to build the studio, which will be amazing once we get it. But it's been like taking a toll, man. It's like that sounds, Jesus, I'm absolutely beat. No, of course so. no, that sounds, like, it sounds just... amazing, though. Like, so it's such a beautiful thing to build. And, like, you know, over time, obviously, that's going to build into something. But just that it's great to have a place where so many songs come out of, right? And a community of songwriters and people. Yeah. It's a really great thing to do, dude. Yeah. I think, I think, um, like, I think. People, it's funny because there's there's a couple of guys that have never written songs and just like wrote like these poems and they won't want to show them. They were more into, they were kind of, everyone was quite nervous. And the, like, there's cause some guys that just come in and go, right, ready to go. And they'll write like 50 songs and it's like brilliant. And it's like, okay, I'll leave you to it. Well, other guys are like, oh, I'm not quite ready to show you. And I, like, and then on the last day, there was this guy showed me this, showed me this poem that he'd been writing and he'd been working on it the whole time, the six days he was there. And he was like, I'm ready to show you. And he showed me it. 
he's like, could you put this in a song? And it took me like 10 minutes to do it. And it was like one of the best songs ever on the camp. Oh, yeah, and it's like, it's really special. So it's pretty cool to see how the cookie crumbles on some stuff because you don't expect that. And you don't expect some collaborations to work. Like we put different people in different groups and yeah. some of them come out. You're like, holy smokes, man. Like these, these like these pop girls are coming with these like big like, hairy rock guys and they're coming out with the best song in the world. It's pretty yeah, cool man. to see the vers- versatility striking like that. It's cool. That's great. Quincy, man. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, it's class, man. Really good stuff. So, early songwriting influence for you, then. So, to tell me who like impacted you to pick up a guitar and what what songwriters kind of inspired you when you were starting out. Well, my first my first thing I, I, I loved musicals when I was a kid, so I used to love Grease and like Jesus cool. Christ Superstar, West Side Story, um, because my mum and dad older parents, so they were kind of always like getting me into like all the vinyls and stuff, and then. Uh, Michael Jackson was my first my first love when I started like looking into maybe writing songs, and first time I'd felt like proper inspired like oh god I could maybe do this, and then I never really started writing I just thought about it and then Eminem was like a big deal for me when I was like ten eleven, and so I kind of started writing raps that was my first thing, um not crude raps just raps <laughs> and like uh, and then but while I was kind of in the midst of that. The, uh, like 12, 13, the Beatles came along and that was to me just like whoosh, sold. And yeah, they yeah. they completely dominated my life. Like like and I mean I I used to be in like gangs and stuff when we were younger and like chase each other and get battered and run about and just cause havoc and then that happened and my mum bought us at the back catalogue of the Beatles. Uh, on Pirate, by the way, it was like Pirate, that she knew this guy at work that got like, all the back catalog on Pirate, mm-hmm. and then she got me them, and I was like, and then I just became absolutely obsessed. I wouldn't leave the house, I'd sleep with my guitar, I would just be like putting super glue in my fingers, training myself, just getting better and better. And then it's funny because all the view guys were a year above me, and they kind of picked up guitars, but they weren't they weren't uh, as into it as I was because I was I, I I just like sort of abandoned all my friends in the school and stopped playing football, stopped playing snooker, which is a big deal. And then I was just like, I just sat in my room and just dominated. And then they were all like, and I kind of became a wee bit better than everyone. And they were all like, oh shit. So every, and then I started, started going to this kind of, this, I was like, well, I'm, every lunchtime, I'm going to start doing things. I've been writing tunes and that. And it was, it was a funny thing because I, I would bring my tapes into school to show the, the music teacher that I'd been recording on my eight track. And I was just obsessed with that as well. And then uh, he would, I remember one of the guys stole it, stole it from us. I was like, wait, I want to hear Kyle's songs. And I was like, no, they're personal. And then, he put them on and all the girls were like, oh my God, that's so cute. And I was like, oh yeah, I've got more. I've got more where they come from. <laughs> and, then like, and then I started bringing the tapes in every day and then it became a thing like, oh, wait a minute, you could be a songwriter. And then, so everyone said so then, but then, but then the year above me was the guys that I met from The View. They were already pals, but they when I went to the same like primary as nursery, so I always knew them. Uh, they were in my brother's year and then I was, I was like, basically I'm going to start a band and then, Loads of people turned up with the guitars and we kind of sipped through the shit. So it was me and Pete who started rehearsing the guy who's from The View. And then Kieran, Kieran turned up because he knew we, we didn't have a bass player, but we needed one. But he just went, his dad, his dad was like, well, if you want to be in the band, I'll get you a bass. So he turned up with a bass and he's like, I've never played it, but I'll learn how to do it just to be in the band. Amazing. I love um, that. Yeah, but we're like, I was 13, they were 14, and then we, was, we went in for the talent show. And then every year the, in the school, the, the Irish dancers used to win it. They'd won it for like 10 years in a row and then we'd done it and then won it and then kind of became like we celebrities and we're school and we started winning it every year. And then it was funny then, but, but, but we'd never really rehearsed any of the songs. It was a weird one because my um my uh, mum, no, my dad, my dad passed away when I was 16 and they'd all left school. I was still at school and they came to his funeral and we kind of had a couple of drinks and I was like, I was like, I'm writing my own material. And they were like, well, and I said, my, pub, my cousin's got this pub called The Bayview. Right. And I said, we could rehearse there for free. Let's just get the band back together and we'll do our own material. And then within a year, it was like, we were playing, but we used to call it the World Tour of Dundee. We'd just play all the pubs in Dundee. And like, and then it kind of, it became quick, really big. Um, and then Kieran just came in one day and like, with songs Streetlights and Superstar Tradesman, he had wrote, he had written them. And I was like, holy shit. So then my, 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 my point on them songs, I would kind of, I was more of a melody man, so I was, it was Kieran was more like a sort of Lou Reed kind of thing, so I would put melody into his stuff, and it was just, it was just a great time. Um, those, started, early days, uh, those early days of school bands and like figuring it out, you know, so I remember for, you know, kind of doing an assembly round about the same age, like 13 or 14, and you've got like all the years above, and to go on stage and do, and do a gig or play one, even one of your own songs, which I did, you're, you're kind of at that moment of like, this is either going to go well or be a nightmare for the rest of school. You know, it was that kind of 
yeah. those early uh, days of like putting yourself out there as a musician or songwriter when you're a kid it's it's uh sort of a big decision isn't it when you're at school like that it is because uh, there's a there's a guy in my school i won't say his name because he still kicks a bit but he was he's a bit of a bully and he was a uh, it was him that tried to make a fool of me. I'm like, ah, oh, listen to these. They're, they're totally like cheesy and shite. And I was like, oh. and then all the girls just totally turned on. I'm like, these are, oh my God. And then, yeah, the teacher was like, I'm not even going to teach us that I do. I'm not, you don't even have to do the assessment. You can just get a one plus. That was the best song ever. And I was mm-hmm. like, yeah. But there was like, it's paying off all this work. Amazing. Um, that was, that was a cool thing about that then because everyone was kind of scared of the fact that you, you know, couldn't read music or that in class. And yeah. I think once you realize you don't need to do that. Yeah, that's and a every, everyone else kind of followed suit, and I was like, "No, you did." Uh... Do you remember what your first song was called? The first song I wrote, yeah, it was called uh, "I Love You." Um, it was like this. This, uh, I was like, I used to I wrote it before I'd even knew what love was. I just did sing lyrics, which is funny because the lyrics are actually better than some of the lyrics I write today, <laughs> and they don't even mean anything. But, um, but. Uh, yeah, it was a. Uh, I remember all them back in the day. It was like one called you wind me up, and all the landlady. What I used to do is, it's funny because you read about these. Um, there's a couple of guys that have been at the camp that go to that have been to other camps like music camps. Jet, sit on it, darling. Come on, sit on it. What well, he's been a riot. Um, but there's a. He was he was standing on the crocodile. <laughs> there's a. There's a couple of guys that were like um. Yeah, showed me like techniques of what they do at their songwriting camps and that. And he was like, and there's stuff that I used to do when I was a kid when I never even knew it was a process. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, was, I used to just like go through books in school and pick the titles, out, which was one of them was The Landlady, which we were doing. Yeah. Um, we'd do, and then and then I would just write it and I would just like see what came out. And I'd get, I'd, I'd buy like an interesting pad that, that I like the look of that I thought I'm, want, I'm going to want to pick that up every day. No, not just your average book, yeah. a really yeah, nice yeah. pad with a pen. And then I just put all these titles in it, and then I'd go through them, and then once I'd once I'd finished it, I would just write the next title, and then I'd wait for the melody to come, and then pick one of the songs or the titles that I'd already had. Okay. Sometimes done it like that, but but I mean, the, nowadays just having a phone and the majority of the majority of how much you see on TV and Netflix and just just getting everything drop of the hat. I mean, recently I've I've been off social media for like maybe five five weeks. I don't think I'll go back to it. Cause it's it's kind of I okay. feel like it dominated my life a wee bit. And yeah. I feel like I used to write a lot more. I used yeah. to write a lot more, but when I started doing the solo thing, I had to kind of get social media, which I hate doing. I still don't, I don't agree with it at all. So I think now that that's all passed and I've, I've been absolutely done in from Spain nearly a month, I'm waiting to go and get myself some new pads and yeah. just try and, I've even, I've even thought about getting rid of my phone, you know, and just getting an old school phone because I feel like it's so easy to just put Netflix on, watch, watch rubbish, and yeah, just like pass much. the time. Whereas yeah. I feel like there, were, there was some, there was so much more going on before I had these phones. And yeah, yeah. even like when I first met my partner, I had I used to always have like a wee shitty Samsung phone, and it was like I was always writing lyrics, but I always had a wee pad in my pocket. Yeah. But nowadays it's like you just go. You, it's so easy to write a lyric, then it doesn't mean as much to you when you've not got to have a pen and a pad. Yeah, yeah. Because you yeah. just like scroll through. Normally, what I'll do is, I'll nowadays because like this the the how easy it is to do things I'll, I'll i'll get i'll get this amazing idea for a song and i'll be like oh and i'll finish the chorus and i'll go that's it done and i'll not even look at it and then i'll actually go and go into the studio say this is one of my new songs i'll play the chorus write the verse on the spot and then i'll go through my phone and i'll just write a middle and on the spot and just see what happens it normally comes out good and then i'll go into my phone and find some lyrics that i'll that look relatable and by the time i've got this chorus that's got nothing to do with that verse it'll end up making total sense it's totally mm-hmm. weird and it's like it all makes sense. But back in the day, I would get a song and finish it, and it did make sense straight away. It never took like the universe to come into play to try and yeah, get it to line. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was so. It's a pretty strange the way things work, but it's more it's weird because you get people coming up to you and going, "Oh, that, oh, that song totally connects with me." And you're like, oh, "What the fuck does he mean anything?" I mean, and then and then because they've said that, you go, "Actually, it does mean something. Maybe it's it's coming from another place." And it's like, do you think, it's it is, true. Do you think that's true? Me. Do you think that's true? Because I mean, I tend I to. Get be- it. I, I I tend to think it is because through my process as a songwriter, there's songs where I can sit down and write them, and it's like an exercise, mm-hmm. and then other stuff comes, which is like it's almost like I'm not. I feel sometimes like what comes through is like beyond what I would come up with because it's too difficult to sort of write in a way. Then I have to learn it or sort of. So yeah, it feels to me like there's two different places. Like there's the the me writing it, and then there's something else sort of going on as well. I think. How do you feel about that? 
yeah, definitely. I've heard, I've heard a few people saying that, and I, I'm, I feel totally the same. I mean, there's a, I mean, I, I think it depends on who you're working with as well. Sometimes, I mean, you get, I mean, I've been in a lot of times in LA. They take their songwriting really seriously. So it's a bit more different from here, where you could just you could just write something and it'll mean something later, which which it normally always does. But over there, they're always like, they're always like, oh, but do you, don't you think there's a better line we could probably fit in there? I mean, does does that connect with you? And it's like it doesn't always need to connect. It's mm-hmm. fine. We'll just do it and fix it later. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, but there, I feel like the we call these big writers in LA, and that's they, they sometimes they don't see that they kind of see the the universe the universal connection the same way that other people can. I mean, what is what is John Lennon going on about he's on about the, the walrus and all this shit and it's yeah. like but now it's made sense to me loads of times you know what I mean I go I finally kind of get what he's meaning and even a lot of Noel Gallagher's lyrics that's just like loads of stuff he's written down on random bits of paper and put them together it's the same with, same with even Tarantino the way he works he'll just write random scenes and connect them all together and it's like yeah. a story becomes a story after he's after he's made things you know what I mean so there's well, no right way to ever with, do anything in it that thing with Noel Gallagher, he also, I was always used to really annoy me in like music press when they'd say they'd use the champagne supernova lyric, slowly walking down the hall faster than Cannibal, as like an example of how he wasn't a good songwriter. And I was like, I know how that feels. That's exactly like how I feel, you know. So, yeah, exactly. You know, and some stuff like, you know, the movement you need is on your shoulder by Hey Jude, which doesn't make necessarily sense, but it really does make absolute sense. You know, it's, it's that kind of, it's interesting yeah. to say that I've been a few songwriter workshops where it's almost overly. I guess it's a British thing, maybe just like little bits of kind of uh, things that make sense later or don't quite make sense, but do make sense. That's maybe a part of British songwriting, maybe. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember, I remember watching the thing on Travis. Um, it was like, you know, you get that VH1 thing where it's like the and they, they, they explain the songs and they do it acoustically, and the, the fans ask them about it. It's like I used oh, to cool. be on VH1 back in the day or VH2, mm. but he was like, somebody was like. Um, was it writing to reach you or something? And it's like yeah. a b- butter. It's like but- butterfly to. So I can't remember the lyrics, but I remember him going, going. Why would he's going? We're not here to assess the lyrics, and he's got because it's one. And he's going. This, I think it's when he's on. But what's a wonder wall anyway? And then they're like, okay, we're getting the reference to Oasis there because it's kind of got this. But it's got the exact same chords as Wonder Wall. But then he's saying, but what's the butterfly turns to snow or something? And he's like, I don't know. It's because it fit. Yeah. And he goes, it doesn't matter. But then I was like, I've never doubted that lyric. And I was like, but he kind of gets offended by the women in the audience. She's like, I think they're American. And they're like, well, why why, why do you have to say that when the song's going so well? And then you have to <laughs> throw that line. He says, because it rhymed. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah, it rhymed, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, stop, stop assessing it, man. It's fine. Yeah, but also, the, the, like, you know, I'm sure you find that certain, sometimes melodies come with words and they don't necessarily make sense, but they the melody suggests the word and it's too... Sometimes you might analyse, do I keep that word or not? But it just feels better to sing it than a word which maybe makes more sense. You know, it's just f- the feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, an, yeah that, that's another thing I do. Like, I'll see when I'm kind of scatting on a song, like, as I was saying, if you've got a, a chorus or something, while it's, while it's waiting, I'll just kind of scat. And then the more I'll listen back to the demo, but I'm just listening to the, the actual structure of the song or whatever to see what I need to do. I'll yeah. sit down my notepad and I'll go, but what, what I've said there is, it's better than anything I'll ever come up with. You know, like, actually, when you're not even thinking about it, I'm just like, I've got the chorus and this being great. Just fill in the verse and I'll do a melody. Whatever I sing there ends up being the the, the verse or the middle eight, nine times out of ten. Yeah, yeah. It's mad. It's mad. And it's like, I've never... And and before that, before you're away, it just starts cutting. You never think it's going to come out like that. And it always does. It always There's always someone in there you could always use. Yeah, yeah I that agree. ends up turning into it. It's so mad, man. That's exactly how I feel about it. And that's why I think there's something sort of going on there, you know, because I mean, I suppose like you learn about songwriting because like you study the Beatles or whoever you've grown up with listening to, you study them. So you kind of become subconsciously aware of the moves and, you know, the kind of things that, you you know, that they've done. But like, there is that moment where something just comes through. And that's, I mean, that's my, it's so addictive, man. And so it's such a sort of enjoyable, thrilling. And all these years later, it still remains like just exciting, isn't it, to write a song? Yeah. As in, I think like the the quicker, like the the more people think about someone and sit on it, what I was on about like the LA writers and stuff. Don't get me wrong, I love I love the process of every writer, but it's just not the way I really do it. Like in the the camps there as well, there's a couple of there's a guy that I work with, and he's always like kind of prodding me, going, like, "You need to, you kind of need to do a bit more work." Um, which because he's we're both quite ADHD and we're like running about like lunatics, but he's like 
He's like, come on. He says, you've only been working for a couple of hours, and that's basically my job is to, to go go around and make sure people are yeah. fine and writing their songs and doing their bit. And um, but I'm like, but I did. I just went up, and they're like, I says, I, they, they showed me their their verse, and I put a verse on it. And he's like, but you should be sitting longer and trying to go through it. I says, no, but that's how I do it. Yeah. He says, I think if I overthink it, it's not good. It doesn't it doesn't work? And I, and I'm trying to tell them not to do that. I'm showing them how quick it could be done. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that that people that have never written before, and they're I'm trying to show them the the, the way I do it. And he's like, I know, but it'd be good if you could sit down for at least an hour or two with each person. I'm like, no, it's no way, man. It's just, you'd pay me a lot more money than that. Yeah, I mean, well, that's like, come on. You're, you're right though, because I've, I've done stuff like that, and it's, it's like you say when when it, if it, if you have the feeling if you have the experience like you and I both do, it seems where something can be extremely quick. You can't really explain that, can you? It's just like well, I wrote it and it just happened, and that's. You just be open to. I guess that one of the ideas is to be open to um to get out your way a bit. I mean, it's sort of mental process, you know. Just don't overthink and just just let it happen, you know. Stay involved with yeah. the, whatever <laughs> the universe, whatever it is, bringing you bringing you music. Do you yeah, think? Man, it's, it's I, I read that... somewhere in your, I think one of the biographies somewhere that playing covers. You used to play covers early, early in the days with the band, sort of playing gigs and in pubs. Do you think that shaped your um? sort of the instinct for songwriting a bit as well because obviously if you're playing a, if you're playing a bar you've got to cut over noise you've got to cut over people to get anyone's attention or for them to have a good time the, the, the choruses have got to kind of work do you think that impacted your songwriting those early days of doing that stuff definitely because i was uh i was brought up in like as i say like, I, I mean when i was when i used to play in pubs i would i'd basically just I kind of had this, it was a, a lot of older women that came to see me. I used to play in these couple of pubs and it was, that was my kind of clientele. So I had to play like, um, I would just, the, my thing was basically if they, te- if they tell me a song, I'll be able to play it. And that was kind of my, my thing. And then people would go, people would come and see it and they would say, um, be like, take that. And then go, bet you can't play this, take that song. And I would go, bet I can. And then it would just play it. It would just be like that. And yeah. I'd play all these like sort of cheesy 90s, um, like sort of Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and all that kind of stuff. So even though I, I grew up in indie music and all that and I loved all that, I've, I've always I had older sisters that were always pushing that on me. Shania Twain, like Celine Dion, like yeah. I, that was like what I kind of. So I know I know all that kind of stuff as well. I mean, I would never go and buy the records, but my sisters heard them and I would kind of borrow them and put them on. I was like, I loved a lot of Billy Joel, like George Michael. I basically love everything, and that's that's great. Uh, and I know it all, so there's nothing that I don't really know. I think that's um, great, though. I think... I have to, to have that open mindedness, and to have also to, to. I mean, it's all great pop, isn't it? And like, you are a great pop writer. Your commercial, your sense of sort of commercial. I mean that. I mean, like it's so melodic. Yeah. And commercial and pop, you know, within the medium of like an indie band or the, with your solo albums, it's different. But it's just like your songs could be done you know, with a string quartet or a band or with beats or whatever, because you're a really great melodic writer, you know, and that's come, you know, that's obviously in you, but it's also a, a, um, it's interesting to hear you talk about, you know, having so much music around you at that point and learning that stuff and playing it and just maybe not being judgmental about it. Just, just yeah. listening and learning. I mean, basically that's what I always say to people. It's like, um, I go, well, you're a Beatles fan, like you're the Rolling Stones. Like I, I always think it's that there, there was a, there was a, barrier and it was funny because you get all these all these young kids and they'd go how how could you do that how are you able to do that and I'm like because I listen to Celine Dion <laughs> it's, it's fucking easy yeah, easy yeah. stuff listen to the Beatles obviously but listen and not I mean listen to Max Martin stuff listen to like stuff that you shouldn't be afraid to listen to but like society and, and has categorized your opinion for some reason it's like yeah. you shouldn't have to do that and it's like you I used to get slagged at school for liking the stuff you know what I mean but I was like and that's not I, I more fool you you're the idea that kind of go they're like how could you write middle eights like that and I'm like fair listen to NSYNC or Backstreet Boys like yeah. every Max Martin they're, they're, they come from that like obviously from the Beatles but but thing is, but the Beatles do it, but they're also some of the structures of the Beatles stuff are quite are quite confusing. It's always like it'll be like Vess. Some of the songs don't, don't really have choruses. I don't think it's just like it's just like verse, bridge, verse, bridge, verse, bridge, verse, bridge out, fine. and it's like yeah, yeah, it's mental. It doesn't yeah. really make so it's like structurally sometimes I was baffled by that. And then once I started realizing all the Max Martin stuff and Backstreet Boys, and it was like. Oh, then that's kind of like how I structure a song. You know what I mean? Like, be like, like sort of intro, verse, like chorus, re-intro, second verse, chorus, middle eight, quiet, quiet, cor- quiet chorus or quiet verse, uh, chorus, and then out. That's like the way that, I, and it's funny because I don't even mean to do that. But then once I start, once I got older, I started going, oh, I'm just kind of sticking to a formula here that I never knew I was doing. 
Yeah. Um, and the only time I wouldn't do that is when I'm trying to be a wee bit outlandish and be a bit weird. But yeah. normally that's what I do. And even and some you won't always notice because the because the shorter the song or the longer the song called it could be, even if you put that in that it could be a minor song rather than a major song, it, people think it's so versatile, but you're still using the same structure all the time, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So do you write every day then? Does, I mean, obviously you have been because you've been on songwriting camps, so I guess, but is it a thing, you, do you pick up a guitar or piano and, and do you write every day? I pretty much I pretty much write something every day. It's normally at annoying times, like when I'm waiting to go to bed and I'm like, oh no, and the song will hit and then I've got to kind of creep up and get the piano or the uke. I do a lot of stuff on the uke and a lot of stuff on the piano and cause basically I've put all my guitars in Spain and all my other stuff's in the, the Views lockup. So I've got, I've just got the kids like these black star we black star amps and basses yeah. and that so I play, I play them sometimes so but yeah it's more piano stuff I write on because if I, if I find a melody I normally write the melody in my head first I'll be walking on the day I'll, fit, I'll get it I'll maybe demo it but if it's that strong I won't I'll just I'll just wait till I get home and I'll put it I'll, I'll play it on the piano I normally ask the kids what they think and they're like oh my God, I write with my daughter Wild as well she's six but yeah. I got like there was a song on the, the last view album that she done that never made the album but it went on the, the Japanese edition so I'm pretty, quite proud of that that's brilliant so they're kids musical then obviously they are they could they've got the yeah they could yeah they could all they could all sing i'm just trying to teach them to harmonize that's quite i don't think i was quite harmonizing at six so i'm gonna get i'm like i kind of get pretty strict to them right now but but yeah they sing they all sing a great the old whistle and taylor swift and all that it's funny because i never really liked to, I, I always taylor swift was quite a, a late bloomer for me because i always used to think, was, what's the big deal about it? But now the kids start looking her went on a back catalog and I'm like, holy shit, what have I been missing all my life? This is brilliant. Yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah. class. I had that with Drake with my daughter. Just did one of those things where you don't quite get it and then it's sort of you, your kids playing and you're like, okay, yeah, I totally get this. This is... Uh... I've still... My kids, kids are not into Drake yet, but I'm sure there will be one day, but I've still... I I really don't get that yet, but maybe it'll come when once I start no, listening to the There's a track started from the bottom is the one that broke it open for me. Um, that that tune kind of started me on the, the Drake quest. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, like you said, the kid, the, the kids, mate. It, you know, again, I think what's coming across from what you're saying, which is really good to hear, is there's no snobbiness or judgment about music. Music is music. Yeah, never, um, man. Never. It's all important, you know. Yeah, man. Definitely. Um, what? If you could say anything, if if you could introduce people that didn't know your songs, what, are, there, are there like two or three songs that you think define you as a writer that you've written already that you would say those are my two or three, those are the ones I'm most proud of, or they kind of say what you know they they pull forward all my influences and uh, and who I am. If you could, you pick two or three songs you think that you're most proud of. Um. Yeah, there's some that there's ones that like show the the versatility that I can always say. There's one called Grace. Uh, that's on um actually there's a song called Life that's uh, that's on uh, the third the third album that not a lot of people that that is not one of our most commercial albums. I mean it did that did do well, but that's one I'm pretty proud of because yeah that was that was uh, one of the that was one that was uh, one that was uh, kind of I wrote this song uh, when my when my dad had died when I was sixteen and then I never finished it and then because it was quite it was a weird one and it was and then. When my mum died, when I was recording the the album of youth, he was like, "What? Could you show me something you've never played?" And I played that song, and he was like, "Well, if your mum just died, could you not continue the chorus?" And we kind of connected a song, and I put another chorus in, and it was a magical time. Wow. And we had this like fifty piece orchestra on it, and it was rec- recorded in the Sphere Studio. That was a pretty big moment. Um, but that's that was uh, that was cool. But I mean, and that that's like a sort of more sort of indie sort of poppy song. But I've got a song called Grace. Which is also on the album, um, yeah. and then there's a song called "Distant the Balloon," which is like, which was like when we were pretty mad on the, on the drugs and the everything, and it was like, just about this pirate. This about it was like comparing if Dundonians were pirates, <laughs> and it was like I was really out there. It was like being up for weeks, and it was like me and Owen Morris wrote it. It was like just. I had, I had sat down with the guitar and wrote it and Owen got the, the piano out and I was like, do, 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 got really crazy in the studio one night. And then we sent it to this guy called Ollie Cross, who'd done all the strings for the Verve's album, the Bittersweet Symphony and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. He, he was like, he wrote he wrote all these parts on a sonnet and all these songs, basically on Urban Hymns. And yeah. we sent it to him and then we'd kind of sent him this wee mini score. We put it into this programme where we're just playing stuff. We sent him what we wanted it to be. And he sent it back, and we were like, "Fuck, of course, we're still like high." <laughs> like he yeah. sent it back the next day, and we were like, 
oh, my, it blew everyone's mind. And then the label came in and went, what the fuck are you playing at? This is like outrageous. This is not a pop album. This is not what we want to hear. But I'm pretty proud of that song. That's um, amazing. Uh, still, that's one of one. If I'm out, no, if I'm like, if I've got, I'm at the house in Spain or that, and people are like, we're just kind of having a buzz and we're up late at night, I'll be like, oh, I mean, it's not all pop, you know, I've got this, it's like a sort of classical, druggy, mental pilot song. It's pretty cool. That's great, man. You spoke yeah. very um, openly and honestly about some, some, you know, some battles with addictions or, or recovery and things like that. Do you, has that um, impacted the way you write songs? I'm, I'm in recovery myself, so I hope it's not. Um, you don't mind me asking the question, but you no, found, found you to be very brave and and you know like open, happily vulnerable about it and honest. So just wondering, does that has that impacted or changed the way that battle or those kind of you know those areas does has that impacted your songwriting? Well, I feel like it's a weird one because I feel like on the first on the first album when we were writing, we were writing about being being high and being, doing all the stuff, but we actually we're not actually high. It wasn't a physical high at the time when I was writing them, but I'd been high. Yeah. But then, then on the second, this whole second record, I was I can't remember writing it. Don't remember recording it. The third album was total sobriety. Right. Um, but I wasn't in recovery or anything like that. Just used didn't let us didn't let us drink in the studio. So yeah, that was pretty cool because after coming from being writing about drugs and all this stuff and that, then. The third one was like youth was like making her do like clay models and draw her and her feelings and paint and get reiki and all this stuff. So it was, at the time we were quite annoyed. We we're like, oh, but then we saw the outcome. We we're like, oh, it was probably worth it. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then and then uh, then it was kind of this bit bit druggy for the next ones. And then the but my soul records were they were all like they were about kind of talking about going to rehabs and being recovery. I mean, it's been it's it's been sort of in and out. Um, but I've realised that, like in America, when I done my, when I wrote when I wrote the last solo album, there's everyone's kind of sober when they're in the studio, so they're not really allowed to bring in right. drinks anyway. So that was I've kind of basically my songwriting nowadays is is sober because I'm around, I'm here I'm here I'm around the kids and I'm, yeah, I'm sitting yeah. on the piano it's during the day yeah. I'm not away anywhere and it's like yeah. um. So I do. I feel like that is the better outcome, but it's one of these things. It's like if if it wasn't like that back then, I wouldn't have got that the songs yeah. I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. Or would have been better, and I would have got more success. I don't know. You know what I mean, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you never know. Know what I mean? Brilliant man. Brilliant. Right, yeah, man. Um. So, I, I, out of interest, what's your favorite Beatles album? If you were just going to choose a Beatles album, can you say? I mean, it's probably. Sergeant Pepper, but also I could say the White Album because there's more songs on it. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. so like, so like, and it's more, it's got this most versatile album. But I mean, Sergeant Pepper was, I mean, I'm, I've always been, I mean, even I've got John, John tattooed in my hand and that, and I'm a, I'm a massive Beatles fan all around. But Paul was the big one for me when I was younger because I was more, I was more into Wings and stuff when I was younger, and more into, I was more into the Paul songs. When I got older, I started like, like yeah. listening, I started digging John more. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it would probably be Sergeant Pepper, I'd say. Yeah. Brilliant. And uh, if you're going to give advice to a songwriter, um, what what would you? What kind of guidance or advice would you give a songwriter? Do you think? Well, probably what we were talking about earlier on, like don't don't dwell upon it. Don't don't take too long to do things, and just get that idea down. A lot of people um go, my song's not quite finished yet, and it's like just get it done and like just repeat a verse. Do, repeat a verse and then you'll you'll come up with it later. But try and get it down and just like, yeah. Like I think a lot of people procrastinate too much and it's like, but I, but that's my process and it's like, oh well, you're 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 going to take ages and nowadays people do not piss about. You've not got any time to do that, man. You know what I mean, if you want to get picked up for a label or get some demos done, you strike while you're out and talk. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and this is the question. I have, final question, mate. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. But final question. Yeah, what is? If you were to pick a song that you didn't write someone else wrote a song that you could live with in your head and sort of enjoyed writing uh what song of all, of all the history of songs would you pick as the song that you'd like to have uh, lived with and written i don't know that's a that's a really hard one but right now right now i would say man in the mirror michael jackson yeah, that's because true. maybe because i've just been listening to him a lot recently but every time i listened i remember when i was a kid that was the first i remember like thinking oh I'm so inspired that I was in school and I had it on my head when they like snapped the pencil and I remember going oh, what have I done I broke the pencil I remember <laughs> feeling like oh, that made me do that and it was like 
I, rem- I remember, like, still to this day, there's never been a time I don't put that song on and I'm not blown away by the lyrics, the production, just yeah. everything about it. It's just unre- unreal. Yeah, I remember the same thing, being four or five uh, years old and my friends uh, had that, well, I can't remember what Jackson film it was, but it's the one he's with the bunny rabbit on, you know, there's a film. Yeah, Moon- Moonwalker. Yeah. Moonwalker. And so, yeah, just Man in the Mirror comes up and it, that is, so, yeah, you're right, it's such an massive song isn't it it takes all the oh, box like, lyric, univer- the universal feeling personal growth change hooks yeah, man. it's just it's banging absolutely banging yeah it's class man eh? so what's up next for you mate what's the um what's the next uh, few weeks and months looking like um try, try, i just got a, i just bought a camper van so i may go on tour with the kids okay. uh to disney to disneyland but the next gig i've got coming up is transmit we're doing transmit it's a big festival in scotland Mm-hmm. Then we've got just loads of summer festivals coming up, um, with a few, and then we're touring in like November, December time, um. But I'm I'm just, right now I'm thinking about my next project. Um, I've I've just done a musical as well, which is Wicked. which is at the Fringe. Uh, that was like that's that's based on my, my missus wrote it, and I've I've wrote I've done the music. So Brilliant. that's going to be on that's going to be the Fringe in Edinburgh in August. What's um, that called? That's 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 my, that's my last solo record, so it's uh, no love songs. It's called. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, but that, but we're doing that. Um. But I'm um, yeah. I'm thinking about my next project. The view album's finished, so I don't. Th- I'm not sure if we're going to do another view album. We'll probably do this, but thinking about maybe doing another solo record or doing another musical or what. Um. But obviously, I've got the studio in Spain now, so. Yeah. I'm thinking about. I've, I'm working with a couple of people as well. I'm working with this this young girl called Neve Zara. Who's a, a young country artist from Manchester, and she's we're going over. I'm going to do this. I've been writing with her a lot, so going to be recording with her uh, over the summer, or maybe just after the summer. So, but yeah, I'm just I'm just at that place where I'm thinking of a new project. It's quite exciting because I could yeah. do anything. So I'm just like, yeah. what will I do? I'm like, hmm. No, I mean, I'm not really got time to just think about what to do. So that's my that's my awesome, plan. Man. Awesome. Well, Carl, thanks very much. And also, the, the, mate, I've so loved the, listening to your solo records. The, 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 it, before each podcast, I'd sort of deep dive somebody, and they're so great, man. They're, they're really are. Oh, thanks a lot. That's, Appreciate that's it, man. Impressive songwriting and um, versatile songwriting. So uh, thank you very much for being on the podcast, dude. And I'll, uh, Cheers, man. Spot on. Cheers, Cheers man. See you in a minute, man. See nice ya. One, Take care. See ya.